So for some of you, uh, don't check out. Don't leave. It's fine. Look, I know in uh, some settings, youth pastor's preaching. All right, we're going to a different church today. Uh, look, it's okay. I embrace reality. It's fine. It's fine. But uh, I am honored to be here today and uh, honored that myself and my wife, Lindsay, get to the privilege of uh, hanging out with your students and helping disciple them um, because they matter. One of our values here at Generation Church is we will fight for the land, and that stands for lost, addicted, L-A-N, yeah, words, math, it's not math, it's spelling, (laughs) L-A-N, lost, addicted, next generation, and disconnected. So uh, we're going through a conversation on Wednesday nights through that value with your students. Uh, But today, as we rediscover church, I just want to take just a few moments uh, and have a conversation on how we rediscover next-gen ministries. And again, I know some of you, you're like, well, I don't have kids. You hang on tight. We'll, we'll talk uh, here in a little bit. But Pastor Brandon, uh, man, kicked us off last week. And I don't know about y'all, but my toes felt stepped on just a little bit as a follower of Jesus and a partner here at Generation Church. And we talked a lot about how we've done a really good job of creating consumeristic Christians and followers of Jesus, and a bad job of equipping them to go and make disciples. And if you want more information about last week's sermon, you can go check that out online. But just for those of you who were not here, that's where we are today in 2024, okay? I have a lot of questions, all right? I ask a lot of questions. Uh, I ask why a lot. Well, why we do that, right? I was one of those people that Pastor Brandon talked about. Like, well, we just changed our values, so we're not doing that anymore. It's like, yeah, Tyler, hush. We're a different church now. I've been here for 12 years, and uh, it's a blessing, but it also can be a curse, right? uh, Gilman, get it together, right? It's it's amazing, and I love the direction um, that we are heading as a church, but it also it comes with challenges, right? Um, And it leads me to the question, and just the question for the church at large of like, hey, how did we get here, right? And then more specifically, how did we get here, and what do we do about it, especially with our young people today in the church? What role does next-gen ministry play in this crisis that we uncovered last week, right? What does kids ministry, what role does that play? What does student ministry, what role does that play? And we're going to have that conversation um, today because I I ask a lot of questions. So uh, the first question and the first thing that I would like to talk about is the history of student ministry. Now, did anybody grow up in, in the basement like Pastor Brandon talked about last week, basement student ministry? Just know my crowd, okay? Some of us, I was a part of that or the fellowship hall, right? Um, I was a part of that. And um, I believe um, in the context of our conversation today, we have to go back because I have done a lot of study and some of you have even lived through uh, the Jesus movement that happened several years ago, right? The Jesus movement. And there was a bunch of teenagers and young adults coming to know the Lord. This outbreak, man, Christianity, followers of Jesus everywhere. And the church had a reaction to that, which helped develop us, developed us into our context of today of meeting weekly with students and kids and all of those things. Because I went and looked in the Bible of how they did student ministry and... Uh, I didn't find a lot of information. Like, what do we do on Wednesdays? God, you know, Paul, do you got anything for the, the kids, you know? Uh, and it's hard sometimes, right? And that's a conversation for another day. But how did we get here? So there's this rise of Jesus followers, right? And so churches started adapting, having weekly gatherings, okay? And along with that, MTV was on the rise. Anybody remember MTV when they played music, okay? I was... Still young, you can date yourself, it's fine. All right, now they just play one show over and over and over again, the same show. But MTV was on the rise. I was a 90s baby. I remember Nickelodeon, Nick at Night. I remember uh, the kids version of Saturday Night Live, The Amanda Show, okay? I was a 90s baby. Some of y'all know, you're with me. Entertainment, Nickelodeon. Some of y'all remember Saturday Night Live, right? All the skits and all the things, right? So what the church did because of what was happening uh, and the, the movement that was happening, some, the church actually adopted some of these uh, tradi- some of these um, tactics to reach those students, right? So how can we make our student ministry like a, like a mini version of like SNL, 
right? Some of y'all, you know, if you grew up in church, right? If you weren't having a student eat a goldfish and puke on Wednesdays, you, what are you doing? <laughs> now, when I first started, I did blend up a Happy Meal and had a kid drink it to win a TV, but we don't do that anymore, right? We're not, we're not, we're not doing that anymore, okay? We're not doing that. We're a different church now, right? But it reminds me of, of where we are today because I believe that churches adopted this mentality and our focus went more on like how can we throw off this big production and, and all these things and we dismissed our discipleship and the reason why we were there, right? Our churches started looking more like MTV, Nickelodeon, and Saturday Night Live than looking like Jesus. Maybe it's just me today. But I remember when I played football, Back in high school, uh, it's hilarious. One of my coaches was actually in the first experience, and he, he helped me with my sermon. And I wasn't making this stuff up. I played football, and uh, I played linebacker, and uh, I stopped playing football my junior year. But as a part of the defense, I felt a responsibility, okay? Because when the season started, our conditioning after that uh, through the season is how many Missed tackles the defense made, that's how many 40-yard sprints we had to run on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday, okay? So for some of you who are like me, well, so if we missed six, we had six 40-yard sprints as our conditioning, okay? There was one week, there was 20, 20 40-yard sprints for our conditioning. And I will never forget the time our defense missed 40 missed tackles, and uh, we had 40 40-yard sprints, and when they started feeling sorry for us, they let us take our helmet off, because I guess they thought that could help with our breathing. <laughs> it's like, bro, I'm beyond helmet. Get this. I'm, I want to go home, right? But it wasn't the offense. It wasn't the special teams. It wasn't even the bad coaching. Nowhere ever did my coach is like, hey, that, that one and this one, that was on us, so we're going to take five off, 540s. Yeah, that was, ah, no. No. It was all depending on the defense and how they executed the plan on Friday nights. But church, can I just propose this question to you? How, or this statement, how the church executes God's plan could determine how far the next generation runs? How the church executes God's plan could determine how far, just like the defense, they determine how far and how long we had to run. Because I know oftentimes when you hear about the next generation, you hear about Gen Z, you hear about millennials and all these things, it's like the first few thoughts that go in your head, they're all bad, right? And look, I get it, okay? I hang out with a lot of your kids. I know, I get it. All right, transparency here. I'm a, I just, it's real, all right? I understand. But I believe far too often we point fingers at a problem that the church helped create. And what I mean by the church, I don't just mean a building. I don't just mean a location. I'm referring to those who claim Jesus as their master and claim with their lips, I am following this guy with my heart, mind, and soul Though that's what I'm talking about. Because I believe if our hearts were as close to Jesus as our mouths claim to be sometimes, we wouldn't see this, okay? We wouldn't see exhaustion at an all-time high. We wouldn't see anxiety at an all-time high. We wouldn't see churches without pastors at an all-time high. There are more pastors over the age of 65 than under the age of 40, there are churches closing their doors at an all-time high and practicing the way of Jesus at an all-time low. And in the context of today's conversation, 70% of teenagers, by the time they graduate and leave their home, leave the church and their faith. Now, I don't know about you, but I put names and faces with that percentage. Why? Because I've seen it over and over and over again. And there's this gap year that happens between 18 and then 30, but it's like, what if you hung around, right? Rediscovering next-gen 
ministries. And I'm just going to be really transparent because, again, these are just things that I see. They're not, they're not pointing fingers. They're just observations, okay? And I am partial because I believe in our students, and I believe in our kids, and I believe in partnering with them. I see this, that we would rather pay thousands of dollars, time, and energy a year for sports camps than invest that kind of time and energy into our kids and students', students spiritual lives and run a race that really matters. It's hard for me to grasp sometimes because I get emails, I get Slack messages of, I don't know if we can pay that 65 for youth conference this summer, Tyler. I'm like, well, you just spent $5,000 in softball equipment. I, I don't know the 65, I, help. I don't, I know you went over here, I, help me understand. You know what, I get those messages often. And it's not, I'm not saying this in a condemning or what, I'm just, hey, here's where we're at. Let's talk about it, okay? Let's move together with each other, not against each other. It's time for us to rediscover how we run with the next generation and not against them. With them, not against them. Because there is a reality. And we're gonna talk about today the race that really matters. It really matters. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 23, it says this, I do everything to spread the good news and share in its blessings. Don't you realize that in a race everyone runs, but only one person gets the prize? So run to win. All athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away but we do it for an eternal prize, an eternal prize. And so there are several things that I believe Paul is teaching us here and I want to discuss today. And the first thing is train to run, run to win. Train to run, run to win. Because I do believe this, we are impacting the next generation and the generation behind us in a positive way or in a negative way, right? We are influencing them in a positive way or in a negative way, right? A lot of your influence is just hanging out at Sonic and buying alcohol and tobacco products for them. But can I just remind you, if that is you, they don't like you. They're using you. You think you're really cool, but you, they, don't, they don't think you're cool. They are using you for a substance. So we either are impacting them in a positive way or in a negative way, right? I've been there, I've seen it, I know, but we're here to talk about it today, right? And I love the analogy that Paul uses with an athlete, right? And athletes in the room, you know and you'll relate to this because athletes are dedicated to their training every single day, every day. They practice, they wake up. Right, They know what they're supposed to do. They know their conditioning. Right, They have a schedule. They have a calendar with a date on it. Right, I ran a half marathon once. Okay, And uh, what I'm saying is don't pattern your half marathon training or your, your spiritual training like I did my half marathon training. Okay, I ran one time. I ran six miles and thought I was good. It's fine. It's like almost half, right? It's 13.1. I, I didn't even know. I just know I was running. Just go, okay? And thought I was good. It's not good, right? I got to mile 10, started cramping up. I'm like, ah, oh, this is bad. Why didn't you listen to Jonathan Barry with your training and Josh and Kristen and all those guys? Your training matters so much. We had a schedule, but I didn't do it. <laughs> we were supposed to train most every day, but I didn't do it. I didn't do it. They know exactly what they need to eat, athletes do. They know more specifically what they don't need to eat, okay? And their training prepares them to win, to win, right? You're practicing football, baseball, cheer, whatever, theater. You're, you're doing all of that because you want to do your best, right? I love what was said back when, uh, when March Madness was going on, like if if UConn 
didn't do anything up until March, do you really think they would have won the national championship? No. No. Their madness started last year. Their training started last year. So parents and coaches in the house, you're, you're training your players on purpose and for a purpose, correct? Correct. Do you want them to be the best player, actor, cheerleader, softball player, base player, or baseball player? Yes, you do. You spend hours on ends, weekends away, thousands of dollars, all for the sake of winning a prize that will fade away. Fade away. You can't take your trophies. You can't take, you can't take that stuff to heaven with you one day, right? So what are we injecting into our students and into our kids that are behind us? And I'm not anti-sports. I play sports. My daughter does dance. We were talking about her doing maybe cheer this year, but it was like, you know, I don't know if that's a good yes for us because of this, this, and this, so let's wait. Let's have conversation about it. My kids, will, if they choose to play sports, that's fine. We'll talk about it, but I can, we, we have set a boundary in our home. It will not reroute who we are as people and reroute us of who we are and who God has called us to be. What's rearranging our lives? Jesus or other things? Again, I'm just going off of what I've seen and I'm not trying to make anybody feel bad. I just wanna have a conversation today because I know our bodies break down, our souls live forever. Which one are you training to win? And not only you, because it starts with you, but your students and your kids and the ones that are behind you. Are we just winning on Sunday? Are we just winning on Wednesday? Or are we winning on Tuesday when it's, it's rough sometimes? Okay? And notice I said your kids, okay? Uh, this is a conversation I've heard many youth pastors uh, have, but it's like, man, they're right, you know? They're your kids, okay? I have three kids. They're, I have three under the age of six. My house is out of control, okay? It's crazy. Um, Abigail, she's so sweet. She tucks herself in at night and all that she's, I'm, you don't go to bed? Yeah, she goes to bed. Zeke is on the table. It's like, bro, what are you doing? Chandler's crying. It's crazy, okay? I understand. I'm with you, okay? I understand this, but they, they're my kids, and I don't just rely on Kelly and James and our G-kids to disciple them. It's not their responsibility to disciple my kids. They're my kids. Just like if you have students, it is your responsibility to disciple them and shape them into the people who God has called you to. Because I know this, your kids are being discipled one way or another. You get to decide. You have them on borrowed time, and guess what? Let's be real. They're not yours. They're not ours. They have been gifted to you, and you will have to give an account not for what they choose, but what you did. And I put concerned youth leader because this was a youth leader that posted this quote, and I wanted to share. I'm like, bro, that is so real. That is so real because oftentimes we drop our kids off in G-Kids or we drop our kids off on Wednesday nights at youth, and it's like... We just nothing more than just a, I need a break. And I have three kids, right? We need, we need breaks. But what if we drop them off on purpose and for a purpose, right? And it's not just an additional program or whatever that it is to you, right? We want to be the cherry on top, okay? And you can say, well, I don't like cherries. Well, you don't like ice cream because when you drop them off, there's no substance to put the cherry on top either. I'm just being honest and real today because I see it every single week. We are here to partner alongside of you with your child's formation and discipleship to Jesus, walking together. We want to help resource you and help you along the way. We find more success with students and kids with their parents that partner with us and not against us, okay? And you might, well, I'm not against you. It's like, well, you might not be directly against me, but you're not with us either. I know that because I see it every single week. 
So what does it look like to win in discipleship at home, our next generation ministries, and as the church, right? Do they only win with their earthly successes, parents? I know some of us today, fathers in the room, you have a plan for your oldest son to take over the company and the business, and you got it all dialed up, but I've seen it far too often when a student becomes 18, they graduate, and what God has put on their heart and the path that he wants, not what you necessarily want, guess what? There becomes friction in the home because earthly fathers, we oftentimes have our plans, but can I just remind you? Our heavenly father has the ultimate plan. So how can we partner with them? How can we, you know what? Maybe that's not your calling. Maybe the business doesn't need to be yours. And you know why I know that? Because I've heard conversation after conversation with student after student and young adult after young adult that me and my parents are into it because they want me to do this and I don't feel called to do that. Each one of us have a very specific calling that God has placed in our life. And the first thing is first is our discipleship to Jesus and love our neighbor, love our neighbor as ourself and our secondary callings. And when we do that, right, we start to uncover, okay, oh, I have this gift, our gifts, and we start doing that and running in the same direction. Not everybody's the manager. Not everybody can be the boss, right? And we all have different talents. If we all had the same talent, it would just not, it wouldn't be good, right? Wouldn't be good. So are you more concerned with their earthly rewards, their money, their fame, their points? Man, you can tell me how many they, points they scored, how many home runs they have, but I don't know. I've never had a parent just come up to me and be really excited about what scripture they're memorizing in their group this week. Right. Or what they, man, the conversations they had, they're so rare. Like, hey, man, thank, you know, their group and their group leader this week on Wednesday night, they had this discussion, and, and thank, thank y'all for that. It's Lord, you, and it's like, I don't, I hear my heart here today, okay? Very rarely, very rarely. But what is our focus? Is it their spiritual formation or their earthly? So the second thing I believe that helps us rediscover next-gen ministry is get your steps in and have purpose in every single step. It's what Paul talks about in the scripture. And one thing that is interesting, because I believe that a lot of us do a really good job of tracking our steps rather than tracking our formation to Jesus. We will go out of our way to get our steps in, make sure we close our rings on our watches, right? Look, it's real. I know. Me, me too. Okay. I, man, I'm a very goal. I want to achieve stuff. Like, let me get, okay, walking around. Yep. I need six more steps. And boom, did it, Right? But will I stay up late to maybe spend my time with Jesus? Will I go the extra mile to be all that what God has called me to be? Because, again, you are the primary discipleship maker of your home. And dropping your kids off in G-Kids or at Youth on Wednesday is nothing more than some time away from your kids or relief. And Tyler, I'm tired. You do it. Right? But what if you dropped your kids off on purpose and for a purpose and intentional with every single step they took to get them connected to kids and students on, at their age, man, to be with Jesus, be like Jesus, and to do what he did, right? To be focused on their formation, committed to community, and to move on mission, right? Not a babysitting service for a couple hours on Wednesdays. We get them for two hours, maybe, and they live with you. It all can't be on us. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 26 and 27 says this, so I run with purpose in every step. I am not just shadow boxing. I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I myself might be disqualified. Wow. Wow. And so can I remind you that we're the Peloton, you are the parent. And if you're unfamiliar with a Peloton, Pelotons have programs that inspire you and help coach you as you work out, as you work out. So as you work out, we can help come alongside you and help you with your students and your kids 
formation to Jesus alongside of you. And so what's interesting, sometimes far too often, we have to start at just, you know, we have to go all the way back, you know, and just talk about basic fundamentals of, of being a Christian and following Jesus. And look, we're all in this together. We had the conversation last week, right? It's, it's, it's all of us, right? And so how can we all be a part of the solution here? is the only conversation with your kids is about their earthly accomplishments? Or could you confidently tell me what's going on in their spiritual life? And I know this, I know sometimes, you know, you, people will come and talk to me. It's like, Tyler, I try to talk about, you know, I'll, I'll ask them when they're in the car, but they don't want to talk. They don't, they don't want to talk about it. And it's like, maybe they did, and maybe they just know that you really just don't care. Like, truthfully, right? They, no, man, you don't, ah, uh, yeah. And so they just kind of brush it off or whatever, ah, uh, you know, surface level. Because you've never actually been there, never actually gone there with your kid. And we'll talk about a few things a little bit later on, but I highly encourage you to care about your, your students' formation and discipleship to Jesus. Are you actively prioritizing not only your formation, but your students? Because number three, and we all do this by training to do what we should. And if you've been here for a little while, these three things you are familiar with. What should we be doing, right? And it's real, it's real complicated. It's be with Jesus, because in return, as you are with Jesus, you can help the next generation learn how to be with Jesus. Be like Jesus, because when you are being with him and you are becoming like him, you can in, in, in return help the generation behind you to be like Jesus and ultimately do what he did. Because again, when you're with him, becoming like him, and doing what he did, I'm telling you, students will look, wow, there's something different about that guy, that, that, that lady. Because you can replicate that. And it all starts with who you are becoming. And who you are becoming at home matters so deeply. Because our daily disciplines shape our habits, and our habits shape who we are becoming. As adults and parents and mentors and aunts, uncles, grandparents, you cannot lead someone to a place you have never been. You cannot lead someone to Jesus if you have not been with Jesus. You cannot train someone to be like Jesus if you are not like Jesus. You cannot train someone to do what Jesus did because we are not doing what Jesus did, right? So I want to challenge you with this scripture in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. Especially those of us who follow the way of Jesus. He says this, examine yourselves to see if your faith is genuine. Test yourself. Surely you know that Jesus Christ is among you. If not, you have failed the test of genuine faith. And one thing that I have learned over the last three years in student ministry, students and the next generation and teenagers, they know when you do not have genuine faith, which is why it took almost three years for some, some of the students that have been around here the longest to trust me and Lindsay. Because they know. Like, is this guy real? Does he, do they really care about me? The average tenure of a youth pastor is 18 months. 18 months. Genuine faith and genuine care for your kids in this community of students. It's just different. It's different. Because I remember a time where it was a Monday morning I was in one of our studies, studying and prepping for one of my messages on Wednesday night for our teenagers and our middle school and high schoolers, just a typical Monday. 
and uh, the phone rang, and uh, Pastor Jessica came in. She knocked on the door. She said, hey, there's a mother on the phone. Uh, would you be available to go down to the hospital um, because her son tried killing herself last night, and they would really love if somebody would come and pray with them? Okay. Uh, so Chase, Pastor Chase and myself, we drove down, and the whole entire way there was like, what do we say? Like, what do we do? Um, because if I'm being really transparent, about three months in uh, to me being in full-time in student ministry, we had a student that was in a terrible accident. She ended up passing away, and then they ended up asking me to do the funeral. I've never done a funeral before. I've never done a funeral of a teenager before. The brother and cousin come to our youth ministry. So all of those thoughts flash back in my head. What, what, do I say? what do we say? So we get to the hospital, and we, we honestly, we, we just sat in the parking lot, and, ju- and we just prayed. Like, God, I don't, Tyler does not, we don't have the words to say right now, because one, I have three kids, and I could not imagine. But it was so beautiful in the sense of the mother had so much genuine faith and concern, and she didn't call the church fussing and trying to get somebody because I tried to tell them, and they're not listening, and can y'all come fix him? No, 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 no. Genuine care and genuine faith, and we were able to minister to him, and we were able to encourage him, and just, man, just pray over him and say, man, there is hope. Do you know Jesus? I know it's dark out. I know I, it's a dark world. It, it's as bright as you think Jesus is. That is how dark the enemy is. Now, Jesus overcame the darkness. Don't hear what I'm not saying, but it gets really dark. And if you don't believe me, just come hang out for a little while on Wednesday nights. Serve at youth conference. Serve at bots. We'll talk about that later. And we were able to pray for the parents, got their phone number, checked on them. Genuine faith, someone who cared, a mom that reached out for their son, right? But you know what's so beautiful? I love when Jesus turns what the enemy was trying to destroy and resurrect it. Because just last week, I see this young man with his Bible engaged in the message listening to, not because it looked forced or manufactured, genuine concern and and, and questions about Jesus and wanting to study the scripture. Family servant, come to our church now. Like, wow, that's incredible. That's what God can do. But it was through the partnership with a parent, not a handoff. Tyler, you know, All of those thoughts, genuine faith. So parent, guardian, coach, grandparent, aunt, uncle, is your faith genuine today? And how are you partnering with the next generation? And uh, you could say, Tyler, this has been nice, right? But I I don't have kids. We don't plan on having kids. I I, I don't even know why I'm here today, right? But how are you partnering with the next generation? You might not have kids, but you 100% have a story to tell. 100% that I bet God wants you to share. And maybe that's something you've been thinking about. Like, man, I I don't really know what this looks like, but I know how when I was a teenager and maybe when I I wish I could go back and talk to that guy, maybe I, I do some things a little bit differently, right? And if we're being honest, we all have that story, some at different levels than each other. But maybe the least you can do is pray for the students in this community, the kids in this community, the pastors in this community, the teachers in this community, the principals, the coaches. Maybe that's the least you can do. And maybe that's your step today is just begin a prayer life for the next generation. For the generation that's behind you. Why, why, right? Because it's easy to point fingers and say all these things, but it's really difficult to try to be a solution and to try to help with our discipleship crisis that we find ourselves not just with adults, but with students as well. It's real. And the things that they have to walk through 
is so real because we did a really brave thing um, this past fall. Uh, we went on a winter retreat and talked about biblical views of relationships and sex and, and all those fun things to talk about with teenagers. It was, ah, it was awesome, right? But we felt the need to do that because what they are learning from the world is not necessarily biblical truth. So there was a desire, hey, ho, ho, right? All out of love. But that led to the final night of an eight our worship experience that turned into students confessing and sharing things, not necessarily things that they had done, but things that had happened to them. Eight hours, and if I heard touched, if I heard molested, if I heard raped, if I heard all of those things once, I heard it a hundred times. And it's it's just, it's heavy. And I know some of you, you think I just want to entertain your kid on Wednesdays for a couple hours. But when we say we will fight for those who are lost, addicted, the next generation, and disconnected, we will fight for that and all that comes with that. And all that comes with that, whew, it's a lot sometimes. All that comes with that, mom, dad walked out on me. All that come with that, my uncle molested me when I was six years old. All that come with that, my grandparents abandoned me. Now I'm here. All these things, I'm a you know, disconnect. All that comes with that, you name it. You name it. Which is why I'm so passionate about fighting a fight in a race that really matters. I tell people often, you want to come serve in student ministry? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the most beautiful crazy you will ever be a part of. It is, which is why when we have conversations with small group leaders like, hey, you're committed to this because we may very be the only consistency in this kid's life. Yeah. It's not a three-month, ah, mm -mm. hey. Now, we have those areas. But if you are taking responsibility of I want to disciple and I want to be in this, this I feel a call, I, I want to do this, I want to share my story, okay, at minimum 18 months because there's enough people walking out on them. I'm not saying we don't have, you know, you're moving, I don't get, that's not what we're talking about. I'm talking about like, I'm telling you right now, three months in, it will be difficult because of what we have to walk through. And it's because our priorities and our, our, our focus are just, and Jesus is just, he's a side piece. He's not all of who we are. Which leads us to number three, what are you working out with? Because I personally believe as the church, it's time for us to put our five pound dumbbells up, right? No offense, five pound people, it's fine. <laughs> but I believe God has called you to bear more weight. And God has called you on purpose and for a purpose, whether you have kids or you do not have kids. Do you have community? Like you, we're talking to adults now. Do you have community? Do you have resources that can help you become the person, the dad, the mom, the parent that God has called you to be, right? It's not just Tyler, fix them, right? Do you have those things? Have you reached out to myself or Lindsay or James or Kelly? We just talked about the power of a phone call. The power of a phone call. I remember, now I am, uh, I'm reading a few books now. Not much of a reader, but I'm learning to love it. There are some books that I want to read, and there are some books that I don't want to read that I have to read right now, but that's a conversation for another time. Okay? One of them of which is called Practice in the Way by John Mark Comer. Amazing book. Now, I have not finished these yet. I'm working on becoming a reader, but I have started them. Amazing read of how to be with Jesus, be like him, and do what he did. Right? 
It's an amazing book, and I recommend that to you. Also, Habits of the Household. Parents, if you have people, teenagers living in your home, Habits of the Household, the first 20 pages are the most realest thing I've ever read in my life. Trying to get your kids to go to bed? That's insane. <laughs> right? I, I was reading through it. I was like, good gosh, that's me, man, yelling. <laughs> it's real. It's real, right? You have one child who's precious and just you want to go and just pray over her. Yes, Lord, <laughs> thank you for her. <laughs> The other one's on top of the table. The other one's screaming, like, what are we doing, right? My mood goes from, like, I'm doing great to I'm a terrible dad, right? <laughs> Yelling, what are you doing, right? Fantastic book. And if you're a parent, I, I highly, we have some of these available in our orange room for you. Habits of the Household, it's so good. And then this one was gifted to me. It's called The Intentional Father. I haven't got around to this yet, but I plan on it. I'm becoming a reader, okay? It's just three books, but this one was recommended and gifted to me by people that I really respect and I want to pattern my, my, my life after. It was gifted to me by an incredible father. The intentional, intentional father, habits of the household, practicing the way. How are you, how are you fueling your spiritual life? How are you fueling you becoming a better husband, a better mother, right? How are you... Fueling, how, what is, what do you, how do you even want your house to be? Just chaos all the time? Or do you actually want to take some time and do some work to like, hey, we can, we can do this, right? Oftentimes, we, have, we sit on Sunday nights. We want to go through a prayer. Like, who are we praying for? Zeke, it's like Cracker Bowls. Like, okay, we can't have any more go fish. You know, uh, Abigail, she's becoming, she's six. We can have these conversations now. And sometimes I'm looking at Lindsay, I'm like, what are we doing, Right? Chan, he's too, like, what, why, you know, that's real thoughts, but we are trying to form these habits now, so when they are all six and above, it's, just, it's part of who we are, right? The disciplines. So what are you working out with? And more importantly, who are you working out with? Do you have a spotter? Or because of your five pounds, ah, yeah, I'm good, right? You have anybody there to put on a little bit more weight <clears throat> to help you? Do you have community? Are you in a small group? Are you in a D group? Because we cannot do this effectively if we do not have community. If we don't have if dads, if you don't have other men in your life to talk to about real dad things, moms, if you don't have other women in your life to talk to you about real mom things, right? <clears throat> do you have that? Are you growing in your formation? Because I know this, we can't replicate our ideal disciple when we are not worth replicating. We can't. And there's this beautiful imagery that happens <clears throat> when we are all focused on our formation together. You guys ready? Check this out. When adults and parents are focused on their formation, committed to community, and moving on mission, I said adults and parents, right? This is not just a... Parents with kids message, adults and parents. And when you're doing that, and when the church is helping you focus on formation, helping you get committed to community, and helping you to move on mission, and then when the next generation sees what these two are doing and they begin to focus on their formation, are getting committed to community and moving on mission, you know what happens? Jesus on display looks way different. And it's, it's a beautiful piece because the cross just isn't over here and it's not just over here and it's not just down here. It is at the dead center of all three components working together for Jesus to be on display for generations to come, right? Where we live, work, and play, right? If you haven't heard those things by now, right? Jesus on display is not just going to a basement, it's not just, hey, Tyler, entertain them for a little bit, right, you know, whatever, or come to church on Sunday and want to do this over here, but it's like when all three of these are working like they're supposed to, I believe Next Gen Ministries gets rediscovered because it's, it's more so than just an extra piece. It's more so than just coming on Wednesdays or dropping your kids off. It's bigger than that. 
Because remember, we cannot replicate our ideal disciple when we ourselves are not replicate are not replicable words. Didn't do good. I didn't do good at school. Now they're having me write papers every week. <laughs> right? It can help us rediscover next gen ministries. Not just give them what's left over and pay a guy to can you do something with them for a little bit on Wednesday nights? That's easy. Believe me. That's real easy. That's easy. But this takes intentionality and work. And work. So today, maybe now, I hope and I pray that your eyes are just open a little bit to the reality that we are in. And it's bigger than just pointing fingers at Gen Z. And there, oh, I tell you what. I know. But um, who's raising them? Uh, I, I can only do so much. Right? And they're actually really awesome. Probably some of the most creative people I've ever met in my life. The most vulnerable people I've ever met in my life. Actually really open to Jesus and, and, and spiritual life. Because if, I, if you ask your student today, uh, what's a trending hashtag on TikTok and one of the spiritual deal, it, witchcraft, practicing sorcery, is actually really popular. Sorry, students. Go check your kid's phone. They're really open to the spiritual life, but to the demonic or to Jesus. Go ask them or go have conversations. Maybe today you want to be intentional. Maybe today you feel called to bring your kids up and pray with them, pray over them as we respond today. Maybe today you feel led to come pray for your, the teachers in this community the principals in this community, and I'm partial to that as well because my mom's a principal. I know what she has to walk through from time to time. It's like ministry. <laughs> Moms and dads fussing at each other and all, I mean, brokenness. So maybe you feel led to come pray over coaches and your teachers, maybe the students. Maybe, maybe today you want to join a small group or a D group and start fleshing this thing out. Maybe you've been coming for a while, but now it's time to get involved and to get connected. I'll take all the prayers you can get. So if you don't, you don't know who to pray for, you can pray for me and my wife. So I, don't want to, I don't know what to pray for. Yeah, you do. His name's Tyler and Lindsay. I'll take your prayers. You know why? Because I made mistakes. I was a teenager one time. And now I'm just trying to like, hey, let's, let's talk through this a little bit, okay? I don't know if I necessarily want to replicate 18-year-old Tyler, 19-year-old Tyler, 20-year-old Tyler, 21-year-old Tyler. Maybe you feel led to come and pray for wisdom because God wants you to start serving in next-gen ministries, G-Kids, youth. I don't know. But that's my challenge today is just evaluate your faith. And maybe it's to come to Jesus for the very first time. We'll have pastors around the auditorium. I, I don't know. But I just want to ask you today and challenge you of how can we collectively as adults and parents, the church and Next Gen Ministry, rediscover Next Gen Ministry? Because 90% of it, it happens in your home. There's 168 hours in a week. We get them for two. Two. So that's 166 more hours, right? My math is mathing. That's a lot of time, right? A lot of time. And how are you stewarding that as parents? Because you have a story and these kids have a story.